Christ Church. Be sure to download the CCLA app, check out Christchurch.la, and follow us on social media. Church, it's so good to be in God's house with you. Come on, can we just give Jesus another round of applause this morning? <laughs> Welcome to our Sterlington and Ruston family. Uh, hey, let me just highlight to all of our campuses, sign up for retreats are today. Uh, retreats are for you. They're not just for your neighbor. They are for you. And so um, we're asking you to sign up, be a part of what God's doing through the retreat ministry here. We have seen Hundreds of lives radically changed by the power of the gospel through retreat ministry. And so we just celebrate what God's doing and you want to get in on this. You want your life, your life changed. It's going to change the way that you see your way forward and change the path that you walk down uh, as you journey through life. And so that's today. Uh, and put your hand on your chest and say, retreats are for me. Are for me. Amen. I'm glad you agree with me. Um, well, today... <laughs> We are starting a brand new series that we've called Uncolor Your World. And over the next few weeks, uh, we're going to be talking uh, and walking through the process of understanding and finding freedom, freedom from the damaging emotional distractions that so many of us battle with every single day of our lives. And by the grace of God, we're going to uncolor our world and learn how to overcome some of these colorful emotions that, um, that hold us captive. Jesus said that if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. And I don't believe that's the will of God for the people of God to live our lives way down from the things that Jesus died to set us free from. Amen? Amen. Come on. Well, let's just pray and let's jump into today's word. God, we love you. And God, if we just dive into our emotions and look over our emotions, God, we, we first understand that the emotions that we have in our life, they were placed there by you. And, but God, even though you've put them in our lives, they're there to complement our lives, not dominate our lives. And so God, if we begin over the next several weeks to, to look at our emotions and look at the, the emotions that are in our lives that are pulling us backwards and not propelling us forward, God, give us the, the understanding and allow, we give your Holy Spirit permission to to bring to the surface of our lives anything that's not in alignment with who you are in the way forward, your way forward, in Jesus' name. Everybody said a big amen. 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 Today, we are talking about red with anger. Red with anger. And I mean, you've seen, like I have, the people that get so mad that their face turns red. I mean, I know you've seen it. It, it happens to me. When I get mad... My face turns beet red. Uh, my neck starts getting little splotches on it sometimes, and my earlobes, they get just as red as you can possibly imagine, and it feels like someone has transplanted my heart from my chest into my earlobes because they're just pounding because I'm so mad, red with anger. You know, I think all of us in the room would agree that we've seen the negative effects of anger We've seen how destructive anger can be in our lives and how difficult it is for us to deal with this emotion uh, that's in our hearts. I heard a story about an elderly couple. Uh, they'd been married for many years and they were just kind of hanging out together, reminiscing over their marriage life. And in a vulnerable, vulnerable moment, the wife looks at the husband and says, honey, I don't know how you uh, dealt with all my, you know, my anger, the outbursts of anger that I've, I've had through the years, but I'm, I'm asking you to forgive me for all those times that I just, I said things that I shouldn't have said, or I did things out of anger that I shouldn't have done, but yet all through those times, you always kept your calm. Like, what, what, what did you do? How did you stay so calm when I was lashing out in anger? He said, I cleaned the toilet. She said, hon, that works. He said, yeah. He said, yeah, I cleaned it with your toothbrush. <laughs> That's just nasty. I don't care who you are. 
But there are good ways to deal with our anger and there are bad ways to deal with the anger that we all face every single day. And most of the time, I would, I would say most of the time, we do not deal with it in the right way. We say things or we do things that, that we wish that we could take back. It's like word vomit. It just comes out and before you know it, there's no way to get it back. That whole analogy of the toothpaste in the toothpaste tube, once you squeeze out the toothpaste, you can't get it back into the tube. And there's so many times that that's how we, we deal with anger. We just say things and we do things that ultimately we, re, we regret. We send the email without really giving it a thought. We just put down our emotions and we just type out this scathing email and pit send. I, I was in a small group this past week where a gentleman told us that, um, Somehow it came up about uh, sending emails, and he said, when I get really anger, angry, I would type out the email, but not send it, and go to sleep, and wake up, and reread the email. And he says, nine, time, nine times out of 10, when I went back and reread the email, I was like, I, I shouldn't send that. I was, I was responding out of, out of anger. I mean, we've done that, though, Right? We sent the email out of anger, or maybe you have made the comment on someone's Facebook post out of anger. If, if, if I don't help you with anything else today, let me help you with that. That's not wise. That's not wise. It's not a good idea. Or maybe you're a, a parent at a ballpark, and in the heat of the moment, you scream out, and you scream at the umpire because you're so mad, just this erupt with anger and you say something that you know you shouldn't have. I, can I just tell you, I was an umpire through junior high and high school, even on into college, and I umpired a lot of little boys and girls that I had no dog in the fight. It, if, if I made a bad call, it was not because I was out to get your boy, and neither are those umpires, but yet they get the brunt of our wrath, don't they? Or you said something to your spouse, maybe you said something to your spouse or to a friend that that once you said it, it's like the toothpaste. You just can't get it back into the tube. And most of us, we can look at, look back on relationships that were lost, so we can look back on, 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 on different scenarios where these relationships were broken because of our anger or because of anger in itself. Some people have lost their jobs because of anger. Some people have going to jail because they didn't have, they didn't, because of an of a, of, of inability to deal with their anger correctly. Look, now's not the time for you to elbow your spouse. <laughs> because though I may be talking to your spouse, I'm, I wanna talk to you today as well. Because we all have this emotion. We all deal with this emotion, and if we're not handling it right, ultimately, it destroys the, the, the people around us. It destroys the relationships that are around us. So we all have to be prepared as we go through life of how am I supposed to deal with this thing that wants to stick its ugly head up in life? So I am talking to all of us. Here's the big misconception about anger is that if I don't, like really overtly or have violent outbursts, then the misconception is, is that then I don't really deal with anger. Just the people that deal with anger, the people that deal with anger, they're, they're the ones that, that scream at the ballpark. They're the one that gets on Facebook and makes that ugly comment to someone. Those are the people that really deal with anger. But I would say that you're, you're fooling yourself. That's not the truth. Though that is one form of, of anger, many times, for many people, the way that they express their anger is in a much more passive approach. You give the silent treatment to your spouse when you're angry. Or you just shut down completely or remove yourself from the conversation. And it's like, I'm gonna show you, I'm just gonna shut down here. They're both equally as bad. The, it's not the best way forward. It's not, to find, it's not helping you find any resol, resolution on the, on, uh, over the problem or over the issue. And so you're, here you are, you, you've bottled it all up and you begin to nurse that bitterness towards that person. And before you know it, what happens? A little sarcasm comes out. 
And then you begin to avoid them a little bit more and more. And then eventually you just have this disdain for this person or for a whole group of people that you've never said a word about. It's all been internal. Let's face it. I mean, we as humans, we have to deal with this thing called anger. And if we look around at society, we can see that most people aren't dealing with it right. I mean, we live in a pretty stinking angry society. And if you, if you doubt me, just turn on one of the talk shows at night. Like MSNBC, all of them folks are angry. CNN, they're all angry. Fox News, they're all angry. They're just all angry all the time. I mean, people are queued up and ready to be angry. Just waiting on it. Waiting on it to be angry. In the classroom, we've seen the negative effects of anger in classrooms. I mean, I've seen videos where students are fighting the teacher. I mean, it happens in work. We've seen it on the road with road rage. That's when we tell everybody that comes through next steps that if you, if you have a problem while you're driving, we're gonna ask you to refrain from putting that little nice little dove sticker on the back of your car. <laughs> if you give half peace signs to everybody that you pass, the dove sticker on your car may not be the best. We understand you're a work in progress. That may come later. <laughs> but people are angry. They're queued up, ready to go. But for us today, the approach that I thought that I wanted to take with us talking about this idea is not necessarily uh, how to, to best or the healthiest expressions of our anger, but rather on what our anger reveals about what's in our hearts. And if you look at our world and you, and you see all the angry people and you go and look at what Paul wrote, it's as if Paul was writing in Ephesians directly to us in the 21st century. And this is what he says in Ephesians chapter four. He says, be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger and don't give the devil an opportunity. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only, only such as is good for building up as fits, fits, for the, fits the occasion and it may give grace to those who hear. Let all bitterness and anger and wrath, shouting and slander be removed from you along with all malice. And be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. In this passage that Paul writes, I see two things. The first thing is I see a very confusing command. Be angry and do not sin. And then I also see an indication of how we can be angry like Jesus. So let's talk about the first one. Be angry and do not sin. I don't know why, but for me, most of my life, I've just associated anger with not good. Maybe it was because every time I've gotten angry in my life, I've done something dumb that just gotten me in trouble or done something. And so it just so subconsciously, it's like anger's bad. Let's not be a part of, of anger. But here Paul is and he commands us. He says, be angry. There are times in your life that you're supposed to be angry. I mean, when's the last time you heard your Sunday school teacher tell you that? You need to be angry. The Bible teaches us that, that anger is a, a necessary part of love. I read one thing that was written about it. It says, anger is a destructive energy released in defense of something you love. Anger is a destructive energy released in defense of something you love, which may sound bad, but think about it. When you love a person dying of cancer, doesn't it cause a, a anger, a, a hate for the cancer that is destroying that person? If I love my kids, I hate, I'm, I should be angered by this moral cancer, like this honesty and rebellion that we see just ravaging our nation. If I love the people of God, if I love the house of God, if I love the presence of God, I should get angry when I hear someone talking negatively about God's house, about the presence of God. There's something in me that, that should rise up. Look, Jesus 
was a person that got angry. Sometimes he got violently angry. In Mark chapter three, after he heals this, 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 uh, this man with a shriveled hand, he, he discerns that the Pharisees are, are only interested in catching him, breaking the law of healing on the Sabbath. And, and in this moment, it says that, that Jesus is filled with anger, Mark says. He's filled with anger that they would promote religious customs over their love for a fellow human being. His anger towards the the Pharisees grew out of his love for this man. In Matthew 21, we most of us know this story. Jesus gets violently angry at the religious leaders and the money changers who had basically kicked uh, kicked out, out of the temple all of these outsiders and So what does Jesus do? He he makes this whip and he begins to to drive them out. But here's the key. He didn't regret it later. Have you ever noticed that? He didn't go back to his disciples and say, oh man, I wish I wouldn't have done that. I wish I wouldn't. I wish I had just used my words instead of, of using a whip. No, We know what the Bible says, that he went to the cross sinless, which tells us that what he did that day, driving these money changers out with the whip, wasn't a sin, because he went to the cross sinless. Hey, before we go any further, let me just be really clear with something. (laughs) I don't want any of y'all leaving here driving people out with whips of your life, all right? I'm not trying to say that's okay. Because neither, n- none of us have the, the clarity or the self-control that Jesus had. Just to make sure that we're all clear on that. I'm just trying to say that, that if you never get angry, that you're not very much like Jesus. Because Jesus got angry angry. You should get angry. Something should stir something up inside of you when you hear about the rights of others being trampled on. You should get angry when you hear stories of of people being abused by people that they trusted. In the face of evil, when we're face to face with evil, if you aren't, if you aren't angry, I don't, I'd submit to you that you're not really loving. If there's something that doesn't rise up inside of you, Jesus got angry sometimes because he cared so much about people. Be angry, Paul says, but do not sin. Sinful anger is this. It comes from loving the wrong things or loving the right things out of proportion. Let me say that again. Sinful anger comes from loving the wrong things or loving the right things out of proportion. If what you love is messed up, then your anger will be messed up too. So, for example, it's not wrong for you to value your name. It's not wrong for you to value your reputation. But if you love those things too much, you will get excessively anger when whenever your ego is insulted. You'll get it, you'll get it, you'll blow your lid because someone said something negatively about you. If you love control or or convenience, then when those things are threatened, what happens? You get angry. Whenever something makes you mad, you should always ask yourself what your anger is is defending. For example, um, when I try to get my kids to bed at night, uh, there's many nights that they are constantly asking for water. I know I'm not the only parent in here. Truthfully, nobody is more worried about personal hydration than kids when they're trying to go to bed. Another drink of water. Want another drink of water. I heard, a, I heard a story about a dad that um, he was trying to get his son to bed and his son wouldn't quit talking in the other room and, and he kept screaming into the bedroom, 
hush, go to bed, go to sleep. And the kid would keep talking and finally the, guy got, the, the dad got so frustrated and so angry. He said, if you say another word, I'm coming in there and I'm giving you a spanking. Some of y'all have said that too. A few seconds of silence lasted and then the next thing you hear was the little boy saying, dad, when you come, will you bring some water? <laughs> That's funny. It's true. But why do I get so mad when my kids are asking for water? Why do I get so frustrated? Remember, anger is always a defense of something you love. And in this moment, the reason I'm getting so mad and so frustrated because my kids want water is because they're disrupting my convenience. Because I love my convenience. And at this moment, I'm supposed to be going to bed. And now I'm angry because you won't quit asking for water. You're messing up my sleep. It's the truth. Or maybe this example rings true for you when you get mad at work because your contributions weren't recognized by your upper management or, or your boss because they didn't recognize you or give you the praise or give you the promotion that you thought that you deserved and so you got angry. But my question would be for you is, do you get just as mad when the credit is withheld from your coworker that deserves it? Same moral issue here. I would say that you probably don't. Most likely, you don't because, be, probably, uh, because it doesn't cross the selfish desires that, that you have about you getting the praise. And so what happens? We get angry. It's selfish anger that leads to sin. It's selfish anger, selfish anger that leads to bitterness and forgiveness. The point is, is this, our anger becomes problematic because the things that we love are out of order. We deal with selfish anger by addressing the selfish loves that fuels it. You gotta address the things that you love. What's the condition of your heart? What's in your heart? What does your heart love? That leads us to number two, be angry like Jesus. And I believe there's three things that we can learn how we should be, be angry like Jesus. So we're talking about this selfish love. Jesus, polar opposite, has this loving anger. Not selfish anger, but loving anger. And the first thing that we can learn is loving anger is all about restoration. Loving anger is not directed at the pro is directed at the problem, not directed at the person. I mean, this is what Paul says. He says, let no corrupting. In the Greek, it says, that means tearing down. Let no tearing down kind of talk come out of your mouth. Don't let that junk come out. Don't tear people down with your words. No, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth. But in the moments of anger, only let those words such as is good for building up. Building people up, not, not to get your vengeance as fit the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Your goal is building up. Your goal, loving anger, is all about restoration. Your desire is to remove the evil. Yes, you have to have the confrontation, but you want to save the person as well. And many times when we react in our anger, it's not a loving anger, it's a selfish anger that just repels people. So let me ask you, when you get angry, is it gathering people or is it pushing people away? Give grace to the person, just like Jesus did for your life. I mean, the, your hatred for the sin comes from an overwhelming love for the sinner. You do understand that, right? So here's how 
to be angry like Jesus. Confront the person about their wrong. Again, I'm not talking about not confronting and sweeping things under the rug and pretending like they never happened. Confront the person about their wrong, but without condemnation or any desire to make them pay for what they did. The confrontation should not feel like a venting of frustration or some level of justice, but rather an invitation for relationship. Loving anger is always focused on eliminating the sin while drawing the person close. While drawing them close. I mean, we believe, we say it all the time, true life changes, true life change happens in the context of relationships. But if any time that we get angry, we're just repelling people and pushing people away, we're not really being angry like Jesus was because when Jesus was angry, he pulled people close to him. The second thing is loving anger is short-lived. Paul wrote, don't let the sun go down on your anger. And let me just clarify something. This verse isn't talking so much about resolving all your issues before you go to bed at night. Though That's a great idea. And something that you should probably strive to do. But it's talking about the attitude that you take when you enter into your disagreements. What kind of attitude do you have? Whether or not the sun goes down on your anger is a test of whether your anger is selfish or if it's loving. Loving anger confronts the person for the wrong and then commits the injustice over to God. It confronts, but then it commits the the injustice to God and lets him deal with it. And when you do that, you can lay your, your head on your pillow at night as an unburdened person and your son and the sun has not gone down. On your anger, selfish anger is what stays with you. It's you mulling over it all afternoon on into when you're about to go to bed and you go to sleep thinking about it and, you, and you're angry about it while you're going to sleep and then, you, and, then, and then you wake up the next morning still thinking about this injustice and still thinking about the hurt, just simmering on it. That's selfish anger. How long your anger lasts reveals whether it's selfish and it's concerned about vengeance or if it's loving and it's concerned with the other person. Jesus' anger in the Gospels was always short-lived. Here's how we know. In Matthew chapter 21, right after he drove these money changers out of the temple, verse 14 says that, that the lame and the sick came to him. Right after this moment, that Jesus makes this whip, drives out all these people for how corrupt they were. Verse 14 says, the lame and the sick came to him. The vulnerable, they flocked to him. They weren't like, oh, you gotta stay away from Jesus. He's just in one of those moods today. Like I saw him on his way to the temple. He zapped like five fig trees, man. This dude is on a tear today. And then he, or he came into the, into the courtyard and he turned, started turning everybody's wine back into water. Better watch out. This dude is, no, his anger was focused and it was short-lived. So the vulnerable flocked to him even after this, this moment of anger in his life. So let me ask you the question. What, what are you doing? Are you repelling or are you attracting people to you when you're angry? Leads us to the last one. Loving anger is controlled. It's controlled. When he tells us, Paul tells us in verse 31, let all bitterness, anger, and wrath, shouting, and slander be removed from you along with all malice. What he's talking about is he's, he's, he's talking about avoiding this state to where you are consumed with it. That you're consumed with anger, whether it comes out aggressively or whether it comes out passively. Loving anger develops slowly. The book of Proverbs, it talks to, a lot, talks to us a lot and counsels us a lot about, about anger. But it never counsels us not to have anger. It always counsels us to be slow to anger. In 
Chapter 29, he writes, a fool gives vent to his spirit, but a wise man quietly holds back. That's good. Somebody, I need you to write that on your refrigerator. <laughs> Chapter 16, he writes, he who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. Slow to anger is better than the mighty. Proverbs also tells us that, that getting angry, angry quickly rarely ends in something good. In verse chapter 29, it says, an angry person stirs up conflict and a hot-tempered person commits many sins. And then you look over to James in the New Testament, which is, I would say, is equivalent to Proverbs. And James writes, be slow to anger. For, anger of, for the anger of man does not work the righteousness of God. Rather being quick to explode and reactive in your outburst, it counsels us to respond with patience and with gentleness. Proverbs chapter 15 says, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Chapter 19, he writes, it is to one's glory to overlook an offense. Sometimes the best thing that you can do when something has wronged you or someone has wronged you or when something bad has happened to you, sometimes the glory can be found in just simply letting it go. Just letting it go. Loving, loving anger is controlled and is slowly developed. Let me close with this, this final thought. When this anger when your selfish anger goes unchecked in your life, we've already said it always leads to destruction. And you can see somebody that's, that's an angry person walking through life and you can just see on the, on, the, on, on, the, on the, I guess on the roadside of their life, just relationship after relationship destroyed because they were an angry person. They were ruled and dominated by this selfish anger. So it's destructive. But there's something else. When you live your life this way, it's not that you're just dealing with the anger anymore. But all of a sudden, you look up and you will find bitterness in your life. You also look up and you'll find some resentment in your life and you'll find some unforgiveness there as well. You show me a person with anger problems, selfish anger problems, and I'm, you're gonna find somebody that has bitterness, that has resentment, and that most likely has unforgiveness in their lives, which we all know are just tools of the enemy. They're just ways to, to trip us up from becoming the people that God wants us to be. I mean, he's, you do realize that, that the enemy doesn't want you to have a great life. He doesn't want you to have successful relationships. He's doing everything that he can to tear those things down and get us off course in our life. But bitterness, unforgiveness, they do far more damage to your, to your own life than it does to those that you have an offense with. It affects you way more than it affects. I, I, it was dad that said, uh, and I remembered it, and maybe right now I won't remember it, but he said, like, bitterness and unforgiveness is like drinking poison yourself, hoping that it kills the next person. It does you no good. Getting rid of resentment and bitterness, can I just tell you, is way more about you and your relationship with God than it ever was about the other person. It's about what's in your heart. What's the condition of my heart? You forgive. And sometimes it is having a conversation and working through issues and, and figuring a, a path forward as, as, so that two people can figure it out as they walk through life. As you begin to have conversations and you begin to deal with some of the things that, that you're going through, and you begin to release that bitterness and you begin to release that forgiveness to 
that person, you're not saying, just for the record, you're not saying that what they did wasn't bad. When you release them, it's not saying that, that what you did is a good thing. No, it was actually a bad thing to what that they did to you. So when you forgive and you release that bitterness, you're not letting them off the hook. You're just acknowledging that it's not your hook. It's not your job to get vengeance. And let me tell you, friend, that is freedom. You wanna walk in freedom? That's freedom. Understanding that it's, it's not up to me. But you know what? I'm gonna do what God's told me to do. And he's told me to, to release the bitterness, to forgive the person. And when I do, I can trust. I can trust in the sovereignty of God to know that he's watching out for me. That's freedom. When you lay your head on your pillow at night, we talk about the peace of God that we can't even understand. That's how you step into the peace of God, handing it over to God. God, I know what they did was wrong, but you know what, I release this. I'm gonna forgive them. I'm gonna pray for them and know that you've got my back. But some of you, you've been harboring bitterness for many years now. You've got unforgiveness in your life and it all stemmed from this selfish anger. Not dealing with your anger right. You can trace it all back. That someone did you wrong. And this whole time, this selfish anger has, been, has rose up inside of you. And today you find yourself as an anger, angry person. You're here today. You're just angry. And I know we make movies about grumpy old men. And we like to make fun at angry, grumpy old man, but nobody wants to be around a grumpy old man. Nobody does. But some of you are here and you know, I'm an angry person, man. And a lot of what you're angry about, you can't find a resolution. Am I right? There's no resolution to it. I mean, how can you pay your 25-year-old son back for not spending the amount of time that you need to spend with him when he was young? I mean, how do you pay that back? Or if you're 25, how does your parents pay you back for that? It seems like there is there's no resolution. Doesn't feel like there's a way forward. But let me just tell you, if that's the condition that you've placed on the scenario to get over the bitterness uh, that you have towards your parents or the bitterness to, that you have towards your spouse, you'll never get over it. And I can just be blunt with you. You're a prisoner today. You're walking around being held back in life. I mean, how long are you going to allow people you don't even like or People who are no longer in your life, maybe people that have, have, have died, continue to control your life. I mean, we have to stop living in the past and nursing the hurt and, and telling the sad stories and just, just, just mulling over the, all these terrible things that have happened to it. Take responsibility for our attitude. And look, I'm not trying to minimize the pain. I know it's real. Like you, I've walked through pain my, myself. I'm just saying that some of you are captive. You're a prisoner to the bitterness and to this selfish anger that you live with every single day. But there is a way out. And holding on to it is not the way out. I was reminded of, and I'm closing, Peter once asked Jesus, how many times should I forgive? How many times, Jesus, am I supposed to give? I, I, I kind of wonder, like what was Peter thinking in this moment? How many times am I supposed to give? How many times am I supposed to give, forgive Jesus? Seven times? I mean, was Peter like on number six of forgiving somebody? Like this dude, Jesus, this dude has done this to me six times. 
How many more times am I supposed to forgive him? Seven? Is that gonna be enough? We know what Jesus says. No. 70 times seven. And he wasn't just saying 491 times and then it's open season. You do whatever the heck you want to to him. No, that's not what he's saying. Someone said what Jesus was trying to communicate was completely times completely. Completely times completely. Because again, forgiveness is more about you and your heart and the things that you're dealing with than it is righting the wrong that someone has done to you. God will right the wrong. God will right the wrong. You can trust him for that today. You'll bow your heads with me. You know, I think we'd all, under, we'd all agree that the world would be a better place. Our relationships would be a better place. Our, our government would be a better place. TV would be a better place. Everything would be a better place if we would just start living this way. Instead of this selfish anger of It would also lead to real freedom in some of our lives. And I believe that today, that for some of you, this has been a blind spot for you. You just didn't realize it. And as we were talking about this, this selfish anger versus this loving anger, I believe that the Holy Spirit just begins to take the scales off of your life and reveal those blind spots that, are you, that you've been tripped up with. And today, some of you are gonna walk out of here with a change in your attitude, with a different disposition on your life, knowing that I'm not gonna allow this emotion of anger to no longer dominate my life. So let me pray for you. God, today, I thank you for your people. I thank you for every person that woke up today and made the effort to get to the house of God to hear your word. God, it just shows the shows their heart for you and, and wanting to live how you've called us to live. But God, so many times we find ourselves being weighed down by these damaging emotions that just hold us back. So today, Lord, as men and women of God, people who are, that love you, that are trying our best to, to follow you and to serve you, God, we're asking you to forgive us. Forgive us. Forgive us for, to try, for trying to vindicate ourselves. God, today we just hand it over to you. We trust you. God, today we walk out of here with our minds fixed on you, allowing your Holy Spirit to lead and to guide us. God, I pray that a Holy Spirit alarm system is set off in our minds and in our spirits. And so when the enemy tries to tempt the tempt us with this selfish anger. Just Your spirit would just ring an alarm in our lives. Thank you for shaping us and molding us by your word today. With your head still bowed and your eyes still closed. Some of you, you've never made the most important decision in your life. You've never put your trust in Jesus. Or maybe you you trusted him before, but you've been trying to do it on your own. And today you just want to recommit. If that's you, I want you to slip up your hands today. If you've never given your life to Jesus, right there in Ruston, right there in Sterling, slip them up high. Come on, let's pray together as a church family. Lord Jesus, we love you. I need you. I'm asking you to forgive me for trying to do life myself. for all the sins that I've committed. Today, I put my faith in you and I turn from my old ways and I turn towards you and I commit to follow you and I proclaim that you're my savior. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Come on, let's put our hands together and celebrate Jesus this morning.